And I work with um, an academic, um, a professor from Dundee, who is now a professor of child protection in Edinburgh. And my role was to give that practice element to her academia. So we worked well together. It's something Wolf was talking about this morning. It was that, that interface between that practice experience, where I said, don't forget the child, and that academic experience. And, and so this presentation today has been heavily influenced by Julie. And, and I, I'm, you know, sort of, um, she's been, she was a mentor for a good three years. Oh, I have lost it. <laughs> Obviously not in technical stuff. You want the side ones. Side ones, there we are. I'd like to talk about developing outcomes, good outcomes for children who live in high-risk families. And by high-risk families, that, that, that's a whole raft of stuff. But where I'm talking about specifically are children who live within domestic abuse, substance abuse, or parental mental ill health. That might be one or all of those things. Because multiple matter. These are children who live with multiple adversities. And, um, and the real key to what I want to talk to you today is that children who live with lots and lots of issues, very complex issues, they are going to have some difficulties as they grow up. Someone spoke today about Jane Barlow's research about children who live from a tiny age with difficult circumstances, and that will impact on them as they grow older. Children who live with, with a whole raft of issues will, have, will struggle as they, grow up, as they grow up. Abuse and neglect are often a feature of the referrals that come into us in social care, in health, things that teachers see at school, and things that we, we see in every day with the children that we come into contact with. These are often compounded by the, by the societal issues, by poverty, by house moves, by eviction, by unemployment, that, so that there's a whole raft of stuff that children are facing. And this becomes a cumulative harm. Now, Devaney and Spratt talk about this as a wicked problem. What they would say is that we concentrate far too much on the high end when children come to us um, and they're highly at risk and we think about keeping them safe, which we should, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but what we're not doing is looking at the preventative stuff. We're not looking at keep, keeping children safe, protecting children before they meet those multiple adversities, before they get into a situation where they're living in parental substance misuse, where there's domestic abuse. Let's try and stop them from, from having some harm within that. And so it's, re, it's refocusing, oh gosh, go out to the refocusing bit, re-looking at where we were in where, where our, where our um, energies go to. Now I'm not saying that we haven't got to keep children safe. I'm a social worker children through. I think there's a, a two-pronged approach to this. So of course we've got to keep children safe. Of course when children come to us and they're in um, a risky situation, we've got to put all our efforts into making sure that we address that and we keep them safe in the future. But at the same time, what would be better is if we can stop them getting into that in the first place. We get into intergeneration cycles of abuse. Now, I've been a social worker for a long time, and once upon a time, I managed an intake and assessment team. And I've been around in that particular local authority long enough, and I'm sure lots of you will recognise this, where the children that I knew as looked after children, their children, they were becoming parents themselves, and their children, were, were, they were, you know, I can see people nodding, the referrals were coming in. And I was, I was getting in danger of doing predictive social work. I had to step myself back, because you could think, oh my God, this is going to happen again. And it's how do we stop it? So we start off with, you know, sort of, there's been, there's been a difficult experience for that child. They start taking risk-taking behaviours. There was a stress response to that, because it's how do, how do I sort myself out? Life's tough. And within that, they're living in an environment that's difficult, that has problems. They, they've got poverty, they might be neglected, they might be domestic abuse, they might be substance misuse. 
and so it goes on. So that's what that child has experienced and it happens. And there is a cumulative impact. So by that, I don't just mean cumulative harm where there are layers and layers of the same abuse. So you might have neglect upon neglect upon neglect. There might be a child who has experienced domestic abuse one day, and the next day, and the other day. We have the uh, young people with the youth theatre, a very powerful bit of youth theatre. And what they were shown was that there was substance, you know, alcohol misuse upon alcohol misuse upon alcohol misuse. I'm talking about substance misuse, parental and mental Ill health, domestic abuse. Believe you me, I know, because you, you, this is what you work with, you will get lots of, lots of referrals about children who are experiencing all, all of those. Where do you look? Where do you start from? The thing is, if they are, they're going to experience difficulties if they're older. Has anybody heard of the ACE study? Put your hands up. ACE, good. Right, well... Somebody was talking about tweeting earlier on. I, I, I was looking at a tweet about the ACE study on the Huffington Post, and it said it's one of the best studies that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> um, this was a 10-year study by Rob Ander and um, Vincent Politi. It had 18,000 participants, and it looked at children's adverse experience. So that might be living with, with, with drugs. We've just have talked about those issues. So if child abuse and neglect would be an adverse experience. Growing up with domestic abuse, substance issues, it looked at those things. And what it found was that if children had grown up in those adverse experiences, they would, they would die sooner. They were more likely to have um, relative morbidity. They weren't going to do very, very well as adults. They were going to struggle. And that was the top and bottom of it. And they were likely to have children who would also struggle. So the top ten risk factors, and it didn't mention domestic abuse in this, but smoking, obesity, <coughs> but there's alcoholism, suicide, drug use, injected drug use, multiple sexual partners. Children who lived with any of these, or more than one of these, <coughs> and what this study says is that multiples tended to cluster. So if they were having one, they would tend to have the other, they would tend to have three. So you would get adverse social um, experiences, the AIDS, <coughs> poor cognitive impairments, emotional difficulties, start to adopt high-risk behaviours, disease, disability, early death. That's why prevention is important. You know, we, we, all, we all live in a resource-led world. In lots of ways, this, this, you know, the maths stack up for this, don't they? We're going to look at maths, they stack up. I want to look at children. If we want to keep children safe, we need to start early. Because we don't want increased lung disease, you know, cancer, lung disease, and um, increased prescription use. Neither do we want them to, to grow up without living in a happy, safe family home where they do well, where they do as well as they could. Serious case reviews. Can I have a drink of water, please? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've authored quite a number of serious case reviews. It used to be one of my main occupations at one time. And um, I'm not sure that we're learning the lessons for them, to be quite honest. I really am not, because you get to recommendations and you seem to be doing the same ones time and again. Um, we hear the high profile ones, and I've done high profile ones, and I've done others, and my mum once rang me up and she said, do you know what, I am not names in the Times. I thought, oh my goodness, I've <laughs> And I looked at Peter Frybottom's work, and he said some new themes emerging, and you know, those of you who've been around a bit, I was quite weary when I read this, because these are themes that have been about for a long time. The first thing, though, is the importance of ecological frameworks, and this picks up on what Wolf was saying this morning. Is it's really important that we don't look at children in isolation, we don't look at families in isolation. Children and families live within our society, they have to operate within, within 
in, 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 in our structures. We can't look at people in, in isolation. We can't look at adults in isolation or children. They belong together in families. Um, knowing families and agencies, that's when we get into difficulties. That's been around since I was a student. Exclusion of fathers. We really, really must keep on. We must remember where the dads are. I did a serious case review a few years ago. And you start to read it and you think, where is the man in this? Where is he? And he killed this child. He was, you know, and, and he was absolutely absent through all the, all the information that was coming through. So that's the negative side of it. But fathers have a huge part to play in offering for their children and helping to bring their children up. We have risky adults, we have risky men, we have risky women. We also need to help to boost the parenting, boost the ability to parent of, of, of our fathers as well as our mothers. We do sometimes look at into fixed thinking. The start again syndrome. How many families do you, how many children have you had through that there's been assessment upon assessment upon assessment? Rule of optimism. We've got to ask, we really have got to ask that unaskable question when we go and see families. Because it's no good thinking it's going to be okay. We've got to ask and we've got to drill down to see what's happening. And we've got to talk together. We really, communication upon communication, whatever we do across agencies, what we all say to each other is we must talk to each other. And that is so true. And that is much more than, um, and it's about, not, it's about understanding each other's roles and responsibilities. <coughs> Because it's so easy to think, oh, well, they won't do that in education. Oh, social work in the branch of the phone. Um, it's about understanding where we're at and, and for these children, let's keep these children at the heart of it. Children need to know that we're working together. And disguise compliance, you know, so these are the themes that are still coming through. Older children and adolescents, I've seen that around as I've walked through. We do tend to think, you know, I can't, I can't say as a social worker, when, 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 when you're managing an intake team and it's coming at you through the door, you prioritise, and the youngest, the littlest, are the ones that you start off with. I'm not saying, but you can't forget these older children because they're going to be parents themselves and will carry on into the intergenerational. Again, these are, again, that's coming through in serious case reviews. Minority of the children in the last Brandon, um, 2000 we're known to children's social care. Most of these children aren't known to social care. The invisible child, people have concentrated on the adults, the adults' issues, the adults' problems, and they've forgotten where the child is. Not interpreting the information, not drilling down, not asking those questions again. Recording, we're all getting, you know, decision making, <coughs> relations with family. Somebody talked to me, I think it was, well, somebody said the most important thing when we look at interventions is that relationship with the worker. And that is absolutely true, whether you're doing therapeutic work or what the research would show us is that relationship between the family, the child, and that person who's working with them is so important. You've got to spend time to make that up. And thresholds, we'll argue about thresholds until the cows come home. What the important thing is, is whatever we do when we get in there, that we do it well. And we remember that these children are what's important. The adults will always, always grab your attention. And we've got to help the adults to help the children, but keep those children at the heart of it. Right. I know you, I know you come from things about domestic abuse, I'm just going to do two little bits on it because we can't we can't think of those multiple adversities without thinking about domestic abuse. It's a major issue. And two women a week are killed in England and Wales by partners or ex-partners. In fact, if I say nothing else, my plea to you all today is to remember that the most, the most dangerous time for children who live with domestic abuse is when the partners split up. When the mother, when the, when, when, when the non-abusing parent, that's often the mother, leaves that abusive relationship, that's when it's dangerous for children. Because the contact, at that contact, is when children can be harmed. I've done two serious case reviews on this. 
and there is lots of research from women's aid and not further, that is when the children can be harmed. So please don't think that just because the, the abusing adult and the non-abusing adult have split up that the child's okay. Do think about that contact. Um, and, and, and the latest uh, we don't know how much domestic abuse children live with. We really don't know. But the last NSPCC prevalence um, study said that 24.8% of 18-year-olds um, have lived with domestic abuse at some point. It does affect children. And I think we're, we're all getting out on this. It really does. There could be physical injury. My experience is what's really gets to children is, there, is when they're dealing with the emotional issues, the, the power and control of domestic abuse rather than domestic violence. <coughs> it can cause difficulties at school, depression, resentment, real huge issues for children, sleep disturbance, loss, really into bedwetting nightmares, and down to post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's one of our adversities. Substance misuse we've spoken a lot about today. You've got a protocol, we've spoken about substance misuse. Um, oh, okay. okay. Just repress the top one. And then what? Mm -hmm. Press it. Yeah, that's a people know you've got experts in the room we've talked about it today about the, the impact on the adults of substance misuse that might affect their parenting capacity you were talking about this earlier on um, what I would say in terms of substance misuse is that substance misuse alone is, is, is not wouldn't mean that parents can't parent it, there's got to be other things involved and it's again we're coming back to the multiples but very often it will cause, or it can cause, mental health difficulties or the psychological impairments. So it's not just taking the substances, it's what happens. Children are affected. Back to the children. Children will be affected if the parenting capacity is, is reduced. It can be neglected, there's physical issues, exposure to dodgy adults. That's a biggie. That really is a biggie. Unstable environment. Very often feel second to drugs. In a minute I'm going to show you some, something that children have said. Exposure to noxious habits. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things. Don't mean to say it always happens, and this is the case. It's when you get multiples. So you've got domestic abuse, maybe. You've got substance misuse. And then you might have mental ill health. In the serious case reviews, the majority... Was it... mental ill health is a major issue in serious case reviews. Some, lots of cases are short-lived, don't last long, they're just small episodes, sometimes it's severe. Um, and lots of people who've got mental health issues will go on to have children, and they'll do it really well. Lots of people will struggle, especially when you've got the, the multiples, back to the multiples. And the multiples are happening. When, I'm going to do a workshop this afternoon, and I want to talk, that's what I want to look at. Where's our lens? Where's the lens? When children, when we get a referral, and the referral is about a child living with parental substance misuse, you'll go out and do an assessment, or you know you might know this in school, or you might be because you're, 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 you're the, the district, you know, the health, uh, health visitor visiting, and what it says on the paper is, well, there's, there's parental mental ill health. And at the same time, there's substance misuse. Thing, maybe, maybe not much, but there's there. And domestic abuse, where do you go to it? Where do you look? Where do you start? That's, that's what we'd like to, I'd like to look with you about in a workshop. About a third of children um, subject to a child protection plan are um, live with parental mental health. It can affect parents in terms of their their employability, so that's their income, trades on relationship, 
and I've just said it's got links to substance misuse and violence. Children. Children would say they, be, they, they get into pairing situations, they feel ashamed, it's not an illness that they can talk about at school. I'm going to talk to you in a bit about some interventions, but I remember a child telling to me, who came, who came to me ages ago, who came to one of a, a group session, that, um, and he said, the thing is, um, you can't go to school and, and dish your mum, but in our group we talk about it, because children feel that they're ashamed. If their mother had um, a broken leg, or um, um, bronchitis, or, or cancer, they can go and talk about that hard to go and talk about clinical mental ill health. There is a huge risk for children who live with clinical mental ill health to have, a parental, uh, to have mental health issues themselves. So it's a challenge. It's an absolute challenge to work with children who have multiple adversities. This is my cat Trevor. Now, I absolutely agree that we've got to look from a strength a strength model. We've got to come from strength. Trevor's strength is to get the, the, um, the mice out the barn. But Trevor was kicked by the cows and it dislocated his, um, his ribs and he had to have huge operations. So Trevor worked out that he could get to the barn without going through the cow field. And so he walked, so he walked every day. It's, it's, I mean, the cows are in the field in summer. But you know, Trevor's tenacious and Trevor rises to the challenge. And that's what we need to do. We need to rise to the challenge because children are important. I'm going to play you a very, very short clip of children who live with parental substance issues. And you no. my already rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> it's really short, but I'd really like you to hear what they're saying. Very often, as you will know, 
when you're working with, with parents who are um, using substances without like alcohol or what, they can be really quite chaotic. So to try and manage the two can be difficult. Now don't get me wrong, we, the, the part of the programme is to build resilience, is to help children understand what the issues about drugs are, is to help them feel better self-esteem, to get better outcomes, and work with parents is to help them understand it's, it's to improve their parenting and enhance their parenting. It's not a judgmental, it's to help them see what their impacts are. I don't, I don't ever would I say that we should work with children to improve resilience when children shouldn't be in that environment. So it's not about keeping kids in a placement where they shouldn't be. But very, very often, this is where, this, 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 it, it, it's out that borderline good enough, and it's about making that better. The Family Smiles programme is, this is running Prestatin, interestingly, by the NSPCC there. Um, Sue Walls is the service manager there. This is based on an Erica Pittman programme, for, uh, which was the Young Carers programme. And, but again, it didn't work with the adults, so we wrote in, um, I, I, I spoke to Erica and we got permission to develop that and, and, and make it a bit more familyfied. So we've got, it's, it's got a child protection element to it. Again, this is a twin track programme where we work individually with the parents and a group work programme for the children. children who, as I said it earlier on, children who live with dependent mental health have got quite a risk of developing mental health for themselves. Um, there's a guy I've been working with in London who is a consultant psychiatrist, and I can't remember the fancy hospital he works at, um, and he'd be crevice across cross with me. But what, he's, what they're de developing is a, an education DVD for schools, particularly for teachers, about the the, the huge challenges children who often who live with chronic mental ill health have to face, particularly when they come into the young carers situation. Again, we do a safety plan at the end of this. So on both these programmes, we work individually with the parents, together with the children, and then come together to do a safety plan. That safety plan is the responsibility of the adult in the house, not the children but it's about how we move them on. I suppose what I'm saying is, we need to test this out. We're doing, we, we are doing a road evaluation. I'm going to show you some slides of the evaluator in a minute. What, we, what we've got to remember, and it's, it's been the theme of the whole of the day, is we can't work in isolation with, with just one little bit of the problem. We've got to work because if you just fix one bit, then it will leak out somewhere else. And sometimes, like with Trevor, it's a huge challenge. But the relationship that you build with those children and with the family are what will take it through. We've run these two programmes for um, oh, just over 12 months now, 15 months. And um, Dr. Krakash Ferdinand has been doing the evaluation. Now, it's had a a whole raft of measures, and as a practitioner, I always wanted to see this. I to say. But what I want to say to you is, it's no good running anything, delivering anything, if you're absolutely sure that it's got some evidence behind it. You can test it out, which is what we're trying to do, but we do need to deliver interventions that are evidence based that we know are going to have, that are going to work, are going to have some good outcomes. So this is a whole raft of measures. And what the measures are showing so far is that it's working. We measure it at the beginning, we measure at the end, and we come back six months after. We do what's called a child abuse potential inventory. This, with practitioners, caused a bit of stool shape because they all thought, I'm not going to ask this, I'm not going to ask people to abuse their children. And, and we had to say, look, it's not, it's about how you frame it but it's the questions we want to know if delivering this programme has had benefits for children. Are children going to be safer within their family because we've delivered this? And actually, after the whole hoo about delivering it, and there was a hoo believe you me, um, they got on with it and did it, 
And one that, the one that they don't do, and there's practitioners who all know this, is the one they're supposed to fill in themselves. <coughs> that, that is rubbish. We've got to say, oh, come on, please get it done. But the one they do with the family, that, uh, it, it does, and it's coming out really well. And so uh, the levels of distress and happiness are all showing, and it, we're still at early stages, to have an improvement. And again, what we're looking at with the children, this is the parents one. This is the parents, how confident they are, how much knowledge they've developed about their children, the impact of their behaviour with their children. Um, so it started up where they thought they were and how, they, how confident they were that they were doing the best for their child. And again, it's beginning to show that this is, it's only early days yet, but it's showing that they, it's making an improvement. And this is about enabling children and young people to feel better about themselves. And it's a, it's a, small, it's a small increase, but you can see it time on time to your better pump on the smiles that they are beginning to make an improvement there. saying is these these are these are interventions that are shown to be working for the child and for the parents so it's a family intervention but the child it, the child's doing better out of it if we can help the child to do better out of it they're going to end up hopefully being happier adults and being better parents themselves and that's what we would like what I would like to think about with you is how how do we work with families that have got multiple issues and how do we make sure that we bring it all in or do we just work on one issue but, but bring it in on the sides? And that's what I'd like to talk about in a workshop this afternoon. The world is a dangerous place. Because people, not because people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to do something about it. We've got to keep them bent as you say in Yorkshire, keep them bent at the forefront and do something about it. Thank you for listening. I really must acknowledge Professor Julie Taylor and Dr. Patash Ferdinand, who without them we could not be doing any of these two interventions. There's a whole raft of other stuff we're doing as well. But I've learned a lot from them as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>